Dr. D. Turley Jr., a board member of the John A. Widsoe Foundation, and we're pleased to be participating with the Neil A. Maxwell Institute tonight to discuss insights into the book of 1 Nephi in the Book of Mormon with BYU professor Joseph M. Spencer. Joseph has written a wonderful volume on 1 Nephi for the Maxwell Institute series, The Book of Mormon, Brief Theological Introductions, and we're looking forward to speaking with him this evening. So let me begin with a brief introduction. Joseph M. Spencer earned a PhD in philosophy at the University of New Mexico and has published extensively on Latter-day Saint scripture and theology in BYU Studies Quarterly, the Journal of Philosophy and Scripture, and the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies for which he serves as associate editor. He is co-editor of the book series Groundwork, Studies in Theory and Scripture. His other books include Reading Nephi, Reading Isaiah, and For Zion, A Mormon Theology of Hope. The John A. Witzel Foundation is affiliated with the University of Southern California, located in one of the most religiously diverse communities in the world. We are a leader in global academic and religious interfaith collaboration, dialogue, and community engagement. Our mission is to build bridges of understanding and appreciation among leaders of diverse faith traditions and to be an independent voice for Latter-day Saint scholarship and life in scholarly and religious communities throughout the world. We are looking forward to our conversation this evening and invite each of you to respectfully participate in the discussion via the chat feature on the right-hand side of your screen. If you have a question you'd like to ask Professor Spencer, please use the ask a question feature at the bottom of your screen. You can also vote for your favorite question that has already been asked. We will do our best to answer as many audience questions as we can during the second half of this session. Additionally, this session will be recorded and will be available to view later this week. So let's begin by asking a few questions that came out of my reading of the book. And then, as I said, halfway through, we'll transition into questions from our audience. So to begin with, Joe, you've yeah. divided you divided your study of 1 Nephi into two parts, one about Nephi's own theological project and one about the theological questions we tend to ask about Nephi. Tell me about Nephi's theological process and how that differs from our own questions and interests. Yeah, good. This is a good question. Uh, I mean, we tend, I think, uh, when we read, whether theologically in a kind of technical sense or whether just as average Latter-day Saints doing a kind of um, armchair theology or average in the pew theology. Um, we tend to have questions that are burning questions for us. And, uh, and so we want to ask questions that bother us or concern us as we work our way through the scriptures. That doesn't seem to settle with me, or I have this part of the plan of salvation I'm trying to sort out. Um, but Nephi seems to have had a very different process. He begins from uh, a series of prophetic visions that he himself has, as well as from scriptural texts, uh, the writings of Isaiah, uh, and from those he constructs a project. Um, and so there's a kind of gap. I think sometimes when we're reading, um, when we're reading Nephi, there's a gap between what we come to the text with and what Nephi comes to the text with. Uh, he comes at it um, with really big scope stuff in his mind. Uh, trying to figure out the whole history of the world. We tend to have very individual personal questions um, just driven by our everyday concerns. I think that ends up looking very different. And part of it too is that um, Nephi, uh, he's had a lot of years to sit with, um, with what's going on. We often read, we often read Nephi um, as if we were reading his journal or something like that, sort of this another day in the desert <laughs> with Nephi and his family or something. Um, but uh, but he tells us that he doesn't begin writing this record until at least 30 years after leaving Jerusalem and doesn't finish it any earlier than 40 years after leaving. So he sat with this a long time. He takes his time constructing uh, and, and putting the thing together. And that, uh, that too is a part of, I think, Nephi's process. He's taken a lot of time to sort this out and prepare it rather than uh, just sort of in the moment reaction, which tends to be our own our own way of approaching the text. Great. So a related question, just following up on that. Yeah. At the end of the Book of Mormon, we get an admonition to read and study the book, but that's preceded by this admonition that we consider 
the history of God's dealings with his people throughout time. That seems to be what Nephi is doing in his portion. And, and it looks like something we're asked to do through the whole volume. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. When Moroni is wrapping up, he, the, the very famous promise, as we call it, right? He, he says, I want you to think on the mercy that stretches through the whole of time from, he specifically says from Adam, from the creation of Adam down to the moment you receive these things. And yeah, I think that's exactly how Nephi thinks about it. He's looking at really wide angle lens, right? Is what he's got in front of him. And he's saying, I don't want to just focus on my own questions, my immediate concerns. There's something really big happening in history. Great. Now I'd like to ask a question about structure. You do a lot with the structure of First Nephi in the book, working to unpack the theological purposes of Nephi's record. How does recognizing structure help us understand the intentions of the authors of our scriptures? Yeah, this is something I think that we as Latter-day Saints uh, don't often do <laughs> with scripture. Um, we, we tend to read a verse at a time, maybe a chapter at a time, uh, and narrow in very locally. Uh, and as a result, we don't tend to look for structure. There are major exceptions. I think most people who have uh, been reading any kind of scholarly literature on the Book of Mormon will have stumbled on, say, chiasmus before. Um, John Welch years ago began to find these, these sort of l small, narrow structures in local places in the Book of Mormon. Uh, and some have argued for much bigger chiastic structures across the book. Um, we tend to be familiar maybe with that, but we also tend to just kind of go, that's cool. Gee whiz, right? There's a little structure there. That's kind of an ancient thing. And that's a nice little evidence of the Book of Mormon not being Joseph Smith's product or something. But uh, but we're generally pretty, um, uh, we're not usually prepared to look for uh, the way that the scriptures have been organized. And this makes a big difference. So um, let me illustrate this briefly with a really big example. Uh, what uh, we as Christians call the Old Testament, uh, as we read the Old Testament, it's organized in sort of three or four parts. It opens with the five books of Moses, and then there follow a series of historical books, right? Uh, Joshua and Judges and so on. Uh, and then we get some poetry, the Psalms, the Proverbs, and so on. And then finally, we get the prophets, uh, Isaiah right on through Malachi. Um, when Jews read the same set of books, they're, order they're ordered in a very different way. Uh, it opens with the same five books, which, of course, for Jews constitutes the law, uh, the Torah. Uh, but that's followed immediately by uh, the prophets. And the last part of the of their scriptures is then the writings, they call it, which is made up of the histories as well as the poetry and so on. Um, and for Jews, this uh, you open with the law, then you get the prophetic commentary on it and the prophet's way of making sense of how the people bound by the law fit into history. And then you get this sort of lesser, less important, but still important uh, material at the end. For Christians, we tend to read it as you get a law that sort of starts the story, then we get the history that flows out of it, and then the prophets that point us to Christ. Um, and the ordering and organization of the materials makes a really big difference in how we read. Christians read the Old Testament and feel it pointing them to the new. Uh, a Jew reads it and feels the Torah, the law, sitting right in front, and then kind of prophetic commentary and historical meaning unpacked. And if, I think if we start to read scripture with that kind of question in mind, how is it set up? Where are the moving parts? Uh, and how are, they, how are they arranged? It starts to bring out theological meaning. And maybe we can even see the theological meaning that we're sort of assuming quietly uh, is there, but we haven't yet even seen how it's working on us. And Nephi, I think, does this to great effect. Um, he organizes the book very carefully, the chapters flow in certain ways, so that we start to not only track a story he's telling, but also we can follow uh, the way he's putting certain prophecies side by side and relating them uh, and hopefully getting us to understand that huge thing no one wants to understand or everyone wants to understand, but no one feels like they understand Isaiah, right? Mm -hmm. Great. So in the book itself, you have these little diagrams that help people to understand structure. For those who have not yet read it, can you just give us a basic layout of the structure? Yeah, sure. Uh, at the broadest level, Nephi just divides 1st Nephi into two halves, and he does that very explicitly, very clearly. So what is now 1st Nephi 1 through 9 uh, is half, and then what is now 1st Nephi 10 through 22 is half. And the first half he explicitly calls the abridgment of Lehi's record. Uh, 
And the second half, he says, is his own proceedings, his reign and ministry. Uh, so you get two halves, nice and simple. Uh, and then each of those is divided into subparts that you can see really clearly when you look at original chapter breaks. For those who haven't read the book or aren't familiar with this, the chapter breaks we have in today's editions of the Book of Mormon are not the same ones that Joseph Smith dictated to his scribes in 1829. Uh, what we have are chapter breaks uh, introduced into the text by Orson Pratt in the 1870s under, under direction from Brigham Young. Uh, if you look at the original chapters, uh, there are only seven, now 22, uh, and these kind of divide, subdivide Nephi's project up into parts. So the abridgment of Lehi's record comes in two chunks. You get the story of getting the brass plates and you get the story of the dream of the tree of life. And these are sort of two sources of prophecy for Nephi, this old world book they're going to carry with them into the wilderness. And then this uh, new living, breathing prophetic gift that's been given to Nephi's father. And then in the second half of the book, when Nephi turns from his father to his own ministry, uh, he begins to unpack these same two sources. So you get an original chapter where you get a massive expansion of Lehi's dream and then a chapter where he explains that to his brothers. Later, you get a chapter that uh, gives you the first long quotation of Isaiah, and then a chapter where Nephi explains that to his brothers. So the whole thing seems to be organized very carefully and brings out Nephi's sort of core purpose, which is these prophecies. Great, thank you very much. Now let's talk about some of the difficult questions that first Nephi tackles. The questions that Nephi's book tends to leave people with uh, that you suggest are difficult ones that can be clarified by understanding that Nephi makes mistakes and that he doesn't hide the fact from us. Now that becomes a surprise to some readers who tend to see Nephi as sort of the one person who doesn't make mistakes. You know, he's the he's the one that's true and faithful all the way along. Uh, you, yeah. you have a different take on that. That's quite important, I think. And yeah. then uh, based on the understanding that he's really showing us his his weaknesses, you then say that it affects how he treats the death of Laban. It affects how he treats his relationships with his brothers. Can you elaborate more on that? Sure. Um, yeah, we really do. We see Nephi is like perfect, right? He's and and in fact, this kind of divides readers. At least I find uh, many many readers just see Nephi as this absolutely perfect paragon of faith. How can I possibly be like Nephi? Uh, and then there's maybe a smaller category of readers who read Nephi and just go. I think this guy's probably an arrogant jerk, <laughs> right? Uh, they see him as so full of himself or something like that. I think neither of these pictures gets at it. I think what we're reflecting there is what we heard in primary or what we hear in sort of uh, lessons where we need it and kind of clear black and white picture. And we've turned Nephi into that. But I think if we read him carefully, uh, if we read first Nephi, we get a, a much more nuanced picture. And um, my favorite little example of this is, uh, this comes in First Nephi 7. It's when Nephi's brothers tie him up and they're going to leave him in the desert uh, to be eaten by beasts. And he, um, uh, as he tells the story, he says, I prayed, uh, and he says, I prayed and asked God to give me strength so I could burst these bands, right, that I was tied with. Um, and it says, and then the bands were loosed from off my hands and feet. Uh, and I think here Nephi gives us this kind of jarring juxtaposition of this sort of over the top imagination he's got as a young kid and I want God to make me the strongest. And God says, cute, nice. Here's what we're going to do. <laughs> um, and Nephi doesn't hide that. I think he shows us uh, in himself a certain kind of slowly developing sense of what it really means to be faithful. Whereas we tend to jump right to the extreme uh, and, and make this into a series of really didactic um yeah, really um, black and white pictures. And yeah, I think this has implications for how he talks about his brothers. We tend to go, Laman and Lemuel, bad guys. Uh, these are they're just so constantly awful. If we read the details carefully, it's a much more nuanced picture. They're comprehensible. They have a, I mean, they get violent, uh, and that's obviously not something to condone. Uh, but it takes years for them to get into a really seriously violent place. Um and uh, and these are very difficult circumstances they're in. Um, and Nephi even shows his own anger and frustration with them as being something he's trying to control and not always successfully. Um, yeah, so I think all through it, uh, it's a much more fine-grained story. We read too fast, and that's why it looks very stark. 
So what you said earlier about Nephi writing this many years after the events with perspective gives meaning to what you're saying, because if you read it as though he's writing it at the time, it does kind of reinforce that idea of the you know, super zealous Nephi who's not doing things wrong. But if you see him instead as a mature person who's looking back on his youth, then it becomes more a situation in which he's candidly talking about those sort of overzealous, fiery moments of his youth at a time when he we could have masked those things, but he didn't. He just yeah. lets you know them. So why does he want us to understand his weakness? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I think there are many reasons he might be doing that. For one, I think he was at heart like a good Christian, right? And so wanted to illustrate um, what it looks like to be humble uh, and so on, even if that's hard for us to see. But what might be even more important is that we have a tendency, if we can read this right, we might work against a tendency that we tend to have uh, as Latter-day Saints uh, toward... Um, idolizing, I mean, it's maybe the strongest way to put it, but idolizing the prophets. Uh, you get whisperings that such and such a member of the Quorum of the Twelve eats this type of cereal for breakfast, and you think, well, maybe, maybe I should be eating. <laughs> um, and we sometimes just, uh, it's hard for us to see that prophets are human beings who are deeply inspired and uh, prophet seers and revelators, but also very, very human. And I think if we watch, if not just pick at Nephi, because we could, of course, just pick at him, but if we watch how Nephi picks at himself a bit, right, uh, I think we can begin to see that the prophets are struggling along like the rest of us. And instead of reading Nephi and going, well, I'm never going to match up. I'm never going to be like that. Uh, we can say, well, God works with this kid and does all this remarkable stuff. My heavens. He's working then with the prophets right now. He can work with me. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not a lost cause. Great. Your last chapter focuses on how women fare in First Nephi. This may be the most surprising part of the book for some readers. Many today seem to conclude that the Book of Mormon says little about women because it's ancient and the book doesn't have much to teach us on questions of gender. But you argue otherwise. Do you want to say more about that? Sure. Um, I've actually been a little surprised, to be honest. The the most consistent criticism is probably too too strong a word, but the most consistent um, concern <laughs> I've heard expressed about the book is people say, "Well, this is an ancient culture. You're, what you're getting about women in the in the Book of Mormon is just what you would get out of an ancient culture. There's nothing to say here, um, and that my as a result, that chapter is kind of presentist. It uses our modern concerns to read a book." in the wrong way or something. Um, I couldn't disagree more. <laughs> right? For one, it seems to me that God probably cared a lot then <laughs> about gender, about women and men and, uh, and their relationships. I don't think this is solely a modern concern. Uh, and two, it seems to me that reading First Nephi carefully, as well as the rest of the Book of Mormon, this is actually a central message. Um, in my little book, I only deal with first Nephi and I just give a quick sketch of how we might read the rest of the book of Mormon. But I think this is actually a crucial theme running through the whole book. Uh, if you read the book of Mormon all the way through asking just about the stories of the women, a very clear pattern emerges. Every single story of a woman in a Nephite context um, with maybe one or two slight exceptions is a story of abuse or violence or hurt or pain or kidnapping or uh, even murder and rape and so on. Uh, every story of a woman in a Lamanite context is a story of compassion, heroism, uh, equality, uh, political power. Um, there's a strong contrast between these two cultures. And, uh, and in the book of Jacob, you get a, an explicit sermon where Jacob says, Nephites, you've got a serious problem with, uh, well, Nephite men, you have a serious problem with what you're doing to women in your midst and disaster, destruction is on the horizon. Uh, and then says, but the Lamanites, there's something here. Um, there's something going on there that you should learn from and they will be preserved. Um, so part of what I'm trying to do in the first Nephi book is to look at how this whole situation uh, that seems to unfold over the course of the whole Book of Mormon is already reflected in some ways right in First Nephi. We're starting to see the the problems emerge. 
where Lehi and Sariah seem to work on something like, it's not as equal as we'd want it in the 21st century, of course, but something like equal terms. Um, already with the next generation, we're seeing problems start to emerge and women being silenced. And I think the Book of Mormon is screaming at us that we had better not let this kind of thing happen again. Thank you, great, great insights. So as one who's representing the John A. Witzow Foundation here and therefore em emphasizes the interfaith nature of what we should be doing, uh, what is there in the Book of Mormon generally and First Nephi in particular that might be useful for people of other faiths who want to read it? That's a great question. I mean, uh, the Book of Mormon is increasingly being recognized as uh, one of the volumes of world scripture. And so I would hope that people of all faiths can find spiritual value in it. I mean, I read the Bhagavad Gita or uh, the Quran and find profound spiritual lessons there. I would hope the Book of Mormon can do the same uh, for all people of faith. Um, but more particularly, what I find in the Book of Mormon, and then First Nephi will be key to this, um, is a proposal, if you will. I mean, I would call it a prophetic proposal, but a proposal about just what's going on in this world. <laughs> like what history amounts to that uh, God has called um, a people to sue for peace um, and to go roving through the world looking for ways uh, to bind people's hearts together. And uh, and First Nephi seems to me in the Book of Mormon the most explicit um, treatment of this question. Nephi's big vision, First Nephi 11 through 14, spells out a kind of historical backbone uh, of how this is all supposed to unfold. Uh, and I would, I would hope that people of all faiths coming and reading that would find it inspiring and enriching to the, if whether they can buy in to Joseph Smith's prophetic gift, uh, I would hope that they can see in that uh, outline of history, a beautiful pattern for the task uh, God has given to human, human beings. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, we've been talking, it looks like we've got a dozen questions that have been filling our question box. So let me just pop that open and begin asking them to you. Yeah. So here's the first one. I realized the other day that most of the major Book of Mormon prophets have a prominent role as a father as well as a spiritual leader. However, very little is said of Nephi as a father in the Book of Mormon, which seems startling in light of the entire civilization being named after him and so many descendants making a point of stating that they are descended from Nephi. Do you have any insights on this near silence about Nephi as a father in First and Second Nephi? That's a great question. I mean, it's really striking, right, that Nephi hands this record off not to his son, the small plates. He hands it off to Jacob, his brother, and then it goes down Jacob's line. Uh, and it does seem maybe that Nephi's son is the next king, though the text is a little ambiguous and it's not clear exactly who it is that becomes the next king. Uh, some have experimented with the idea that Nephi was actually without a male heir. Um, Grant Hardy plays around with that possibility in his book, Understanding the Book of Mormon. Um, so that might be one possibility. Um, it might be that Nephi's son was a disappointment in some way, and Nephi's not sure how to deal with that in the text. Um, it is under the reign of the second king that a lot of problems start to crop up in the book of Jacob that then Jacob has to address and try to solve. So it might be that Nephi is just not quite sure. Is he uh, something like a Zenith character who's got a Noah, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. uh, and just doesn't quite know what to do. So these are real possibilities, but it is strange. At the very least, this much I think we can say very safely. And that is that um, Nephi is explicit all the way through that the record we've got, the small plates, is a spiritual record first and foremost, and one he's handing on to a prophetic line. So it may be that his son was a great guy and Nephi has all kinds of things to say in his other records about him, but for the purposes of this record, he doesn't want to distract with family questions. He just wants to get this prophetic vision on the table and then hand this on to the prophets who will take care of it. Um, I wish we had better answers, but I think that's probably all we've got for now. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Next question. What does a close reading of scripture mean and look like to you? What have you learned about scriptural exegesis and eisegesis that would that you wish more Latter-day Saints would understand and implement in their own scripture studies? That is great. Uh, that is a great question. Um, I mean, this is something I've sort of taught myself over years and years of reading. Um, 
I mean, for me, close reading means slow reading. Um, Jim Falconer, uh, who's a, um, a philosopher at BYU, wrote a book a couple of years ago called The Book of Mormon Made Harder, which I think is in itself just a lovely title. Um, but it's, a, it's something like 400 pages of questions about the Book of Mormon with no answers. And I think that's exactly the model. Um, in my Book of Mormon classes I teach at BYU, I have an assignment my students just hate, <laughs> just hate. I give them one verse from Alma 5, and they have to come up with 25 real substantial questions about the one verse. And they just, it's the hardest thing they do in the class. Um, but also, I mean, many of the students just say, wow, I had no idea how much more there was there in this one verse. Uh, so slow reading, I think, is the best way to get to close reading. Um, all the stuff I've done on First Nephi and Second Nephi grew out of a study that my wife and I did when we were first married. Uh, we decided we would read the Book of Mormon really slowly together and not move on from a verse until we felt like we had something significant to say about it. And we spent about a year and a half before we got to First Nephi 19. <laughs> and, uh, and when we got to First Nephi 19, we struck on some structural things that Nephi was doing. And that was the first glimpse I had of there being structure in Nephi's writings. But it was that kind of just slow, what else can we see in this verse? What else might this mean? Have I ever looked that word up in a dictionary? Uh, has that word shown up before? What if I search that real quick? Um, and just letting the text uh, marinate a lot longer. Um, a lot of things come out. Great. Yeah, I think many Latter-day Saints, perhaps because of what they're encouraged to do in church meetings or in, in seminary or institute, they tend to read verse by verse, or they tend to try to read the whole thing in, in a long series of settings. Uh, you argue for structure, which to me, you know, if we were, if we analogize all of this to a feast, some mm -hmm. church members seem to want to gobble the whole thing down at once. Some seem to want to savor every bite. And you're saying basically step, step back, sit back, and take a look at the the way the food's laid out. There's some meaning there. So mm -hmm. I guess there's all kinds of levels at which you can can read things and. I think that's right. I'm intrigued that it was your sort of personal experience, your trial and error that got you to where you are, at least as a starting point. Yeah, yeah. So the next question is this. Nephi is our primary source for the life of Lehi. What do you think of his portrayal of his father? That's a phenomenal question. I'd like to write more on this. I mean, it's striking that Nephi calls the first half of First Nephi the abridgment of his father's record. Uh, but... Uh, but Lehi is always in some sense in the background, even then, right? Because uh, Nephi is really telling a story about getting the brass plates or about how this dream came into their, um, into their possession. Um, so his, his portrait of Lehi is actually very sketchy. Uh, I don't mean sketchy in the sense you're like, yeah, that's a sketchy character. I mean, it's, it's a sketch at best. Um, we have just bits and pieces of it. There's a wonderful article maybe 25, 30 years old now by Kent Brown uh, on, on Nephi's way of abridging his father's record. He tries to reconstruct a bunch of Lehi's project. Uh, and he does a really nice job at showing that Nephi is a kind of choosy reader uh, of his father. Very recently, Rosalind Welch published an article on how Nephi and Lehi have very different ways of talking about the Liahona, which is a really striking argument she's constructed. Um, that's actually not in print yet, but it's going to be in print in the next week or two in the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies. Um, but it, it suggests that Nephi has his own view and Lehi has his own view, and they, they see the world in slightly different terms. One striking illustration of this, um, Lehi never, ever uses the name Christ. Uh, he always speaks of the Messiah. Um, and when he speaks of the Messiah, he speaks in very Hebrew prophetic terms. He sounds like a figure coming out of the Old Testament. Um, Nephi sounds like a Christian. He, uh, he speaks of Jesus Christ, and it's, uh, he's always talking about the Lamb, and uh, his imagery and his concerns are very Christian. Uh, there's a generation gap between Lehi coming out of Jerusalem and Nephi sort of growing up with this uh, religious vision. And so I think Nephi is always not entirely sure what to make of his father, uh, but is so deeply uh, impressed by him. Um, I wish we had, I mean, I don't want to cast aspersions on Martin Harris, but man, I wish we had those lost pages because I think we could get a much better sense for who Lehi was uh, 
and maybe make better sense of how Nephi related to him. Because, yeah, he's just, he's fuzzy uh, in the picture we've got. Thank you. The next question. As a theologian and historian, how do you confront and address contemporary biblical scholarship that seems to contradict translated statements and or teachings given by Book of Mormon prophets? Please provide specific examples. Oh, that's good. I mean, I want to cheat and say, well, since I'm not a historian, <laughs> I'm only a theologian. <laughs> um, I don't know how uh, I don't know how I make sense of it. I mean, I read a lot of biblical scholarship. I try to keep up on this kind of thing. And there are places, obviously, in biblical scholarship that don't mesh well with claims uh, that we're committed to as positions of faith as Latter-day Saints. Um, so usually the way I make sense of that, I mean, part of being a philosopher and a theologian is that I can slow down on, on how an argument functions or how reasoning operates. So when I read a historical claim that's a little jarring given my faith, I can slow down and go, okay, well, how did they get there? What are the presuppositions? Um, what are the, what, how does the method work that allows them to draw these conclusions and so on? I don't wanna ever say they're just wrong. Um, there's no way they could get there or so on. I wanna be slow um, and careful and weigh it, but I do wanna be honest about whether history is the best way to understand what's going on in the world. Um, and so I do try to read this stuff with a grain of salt. There are times though, where there are direct conflicts, if you will, and the history has been done very responsibly and that's very clear. And there I, I find myself doing one of two things. Sometimes I think, uh, I, I think the best conclusion is to say, um, history is one thing and, um, what God is doing may be another. Um, the same goes for something like science and religion. Science has a certain kind of question it's asking and a certain way of answering that question. And that's an entirely valid set of questions and kind of answer. Uh, religion is asking a different set of questions that uh, frankly, there is no scientific method to answer. And I think the same goes for history. Um, there are other times where the conflicts are, um, I think, um, actually really quite productive. Uh, there are times where the historical evidence is very clear. And then I just have to go, hmm. Well, it turns out there are multiple stories being told and I've got to deal with all of them. The Latter-day Saints are lucky in that we've got, I mean, at least four or five available versions of the creation story. Uh, and that means that we're supposed to somehow have completely irreconcilable ways of understanding how the world came to be. Sometimes I wonder if that's maybe really healthy rather than, right, that's, a, that's an asset um, rather than a problem. And I think maybe this is true too, uh, when we come across historical reconstructions that are just hard to swallow, we should go, all right, we've got to sit with these various ways of making sense of this and, and look at them as serious people of faith and serious you know, modern uh, folks who've dealt with, uh, with scholarship and, uh, and sit a bit with that ambiguity. I don't think that's a bad thing. Great, thank you. Next question. Nephi consistently says that he is likening the scriptures to himself and invites his people and all the house of Israel to do the same. How might this be different than personal eisegesis? Ah, yes. We always read it that way, right? Uh, we always read likened to mean do eisegesis. For those who aren't familiar with that term, uh, eisegesis means uh, sort of reading yourself into the scriptures, right? Um, uh, so you might take a passage that uh, just sounds like it means such and such, and you kind of run with that and get moving um, and start interpreting it in, in light of your everyday life. But actually, that's really deeply historically uninformed or uh, it actually doesn't. That's not what that word means in that context or whatever. So eisegesis can, can look like resting the scriptures for our own personal concerns or something like that. There's also beautiful ways of doing eisegesis. Um, I mean, a really good example from a recent general conference was this talk on certain women. You might remember this talk, right? Uh, the word certain there doesn't mean women who are certain, but this is how the talk was constructed. It's beautiful, beautiful talk. That's, I think, inspired eisegesis. But it's not getting at what the text itself actually means uh, in its historical context and that kind of thing. And I think we can do both of these. Lichen, uh, we tend to read as a, 
as a kind of encouragement to do eisegesis. Take the text, find a meaning immediately in your everyday life, and ask yourself uh, sort of devotional questions. Um, and I think we should do that. I don't think it's what Nephi means by lichen. Um, we've often used the verse that way, and I don't think that's a terrible thing. But I actually think Nephi is very explicit and very careful about how he uses the word. And this is part of what I argue about in the book. Nephi seems to mean by lichen that uh, he finds in Isaiah's prophecies, very specifically, uh, a kind of pattern for how, uh, how God is working through the covenant people. And then he says, well, we're a part of the covenant people. So what if we take what Isaiah has laid out for the whole history of Israel and say that kind of thing might happen sort of in a smaller local version with this remnant or branch of Israel in the new world. And so just like Jews go into exile in Babylon and then come back to their promised lands, Lehi's children will in some sense be in exile among a foreign people, Europeans who come to the new world, but then they'll be restored to their promised, their promises and their promised lands. Uh, just like Isaiah speaks of a sealed book that, uh, that has to be read on the rooftop someday. We're writing a book that's going to be sealed and will be read on the rooftop someday. Uh, but he does seem to be thinking much bigger picture than just, okay, how do I read this verse and apply it right to my everyday life? Thank you. That's a great insight. Next question. The Mosiah priority theory is generally, if not universally accepted, that the dictation of the manuscript after the 116 pages were lost, continued with Mosiah through Mormon, then went back to 1 Nephi, 2 Nephi, etc., through words of Mormon. Question, did Mosiah priority play any role in your analysis? Did you take it into account at any point? That's a good question. I didn't in this little book. Um... There wasn't since the book was just on First Nephi. Uh, I didn't. Uh, I didn't take. Uh, I basically didn't look beyond the boundaries of First Nephi for this for this particular project. Uh, but you're absolutely right. Um, I see that was Dave Bannock who asked that question. Hi, Dave. Good to see you. <laughs> um, this. Uh, yeah, th but this is absolutely right. I mean, this is very well established historically that when Joseph dictated the text of the Book of Mormon after the lost manuscript, he continued with Mosiah all the way through Moroni, and then dictated from 1 Nephi uh, through Words of Mormon. That's very established. I don't think there are any serious historians who disagree with that. Um, what role should that play in our interpretation of the Book of Mormon? I mean, I think that's an open question, and there's reason to reflect on that. Incidentally, Sharon Harris's volume in this same series, uh, she does the volume on Enos Jerem and Omni, she takes this question of Mosiah priority very, very seriously. Because she says, Joseph, the very last books Joseph dictates, the very last books he experiences are these little itty bitty books, she calls them, uh, at the end of the small plates. And she can ask the question, like, what effect does that have on Joseph and Oliver's and, and Emma's experience as they hear this book unfold for the first time? How does it affect them if that's the end of the dictation process? Um, I won't I won't give away her punchline, because <laughs> there's a really beautiful um, lesson she draws out of that. Um, I will say, though, that for my own part, um, I'm working on another book right now um, on Isaiah and the Book of Mormon, where I take Mosiah and priority very seriously. If you read the Book of Mormon in the order in which it was dictated, the message about Isaiah feels different than if you read it in the form uh, it's published in. And that has led me to ask questions about whether God might might have wanted Joseph and Oliver to hear the Isaiah message in a certain way the first time, at least, uh, and wonder how it might affect us if we were to read it in the order it was dictated. Um, so I think there's I think there's a lot more to learn from that that we haven't yet begun to think much about. Great, we'll look forward to reading that. <laughs> Next question. Has anyone updated the accuracy of the dates in the Book of Mormon from their original inclusion in the 1920 edition? Mm. Were any changes made in the 2013 edition when they were put in the chapter headings? An article in the September 1977 Ensign says there are some obvious errors. And have there been any articles addressing the professed statistical error of some dates in this article? That's uh, that's a great question. I don't have a good answer to off the top of my head. I'd have to do a little research. Uh, I can say this, um, that yeah, the dates that are still in there have some issues. <laughs> that the dates are often um, 
sort of guesses and sometimes I think have uh, needed a little more time. And I don't think that's a reason to be concerned or, oh no, what does that mean? Um, just a couple of years ago when the 2013 edition of the scriptures was put out, the um, uh, many of the headings in the Doctrine and Covenants were radically revised because of better information about the dates and events surrounding the revelations, thanks to the Joseph Smith Papers team, of which, Rick, you were a major, major part. Um, and uh, and that is just part of the process of us learning to understand these scriptures better and have better information. Um, so I've noticed just as I've worked through it that there are often there are dates at the bottom of the page or in the headings that I'm like, eh, we might want to redo that. But I haven't tracked the history of how those have changed between 1920 and now. I'd have to I'd have to do some research. But I think there's more work to do here. And there are people who have done very good work trying to nail down the chronology much better than we have before. Um, but when when that'll see its way into footnotes in the text, I leave that into uh, to to people with much higher uh, authority than I'll ever have. So, <laughs> thank you. And I will say about the 2013 edition, yeah. uh, it was originally just intended to be a reprinting. Uh, the the printing material was was wearing out, and they had to make a, a new master. Mm -hmm. uh, they in church history and said, do you have any changes you'd like to make? And of course, <laughs> and they were they were kind enough to delay the project to allow us to put those in, but it wasn't meant as a wholesale you know, new edition at that point. Gotcha. Yeah, that's helpful background. Next question. In your opinion, how much of 1 Nephi is strictly historical? For example, Nephi appears to clearly compare himself as the shepherd boy David who decapitated Goliath Mm -hmm. And as Joseph, who was sold into Egypt, therefore, is Nephi taking literary liberties? That's a great question. I think the answer is absolutely. My stars, he is taking so many liberties. <laughs> so, um, I mean, is he telling the story accurately? And I think the answer is, yeah, as accurately as anyone ever tells a story. I don't think he's, uh, I don't think he's fudging the details, so to speak. But he is taking. Uh, liberties, and he's using the license he has as the writer of the story, I think, all over the place. Um, and there are places where I think we can actually track this really clearly. Nephi, for instance, constantly uses this little refrain of, after this manner of language did my father speak, after this manner of language did my mother speak, which I think is probably a short way of saying, I don't remember what she said, <laughs> right? But here's how I'm going to construct it. And, uh, and then if you start to look, you go, oh, Nephi is actually doing something with that language. Let me actually illustrate that really quickly. So, for example, he says, after this manner of language did my mother, uh, did my mother speak as she you know, criticized Lehi. And then when she bears her testimony after uh, this, uh, her sons come back from the wilderness. If you take her final testimony and set it side by side uh, with other passages in 1 Nephi, the language is clearly similar. Uh, and it, it actually seems to suggest that we're supposed to be catching these echoes running through the book. Nephi gives his own testimony very famously in 1 Nephi 3.7, but then that same language shows up in Sariah's testimony. It shows up again in 1 Nephi 17. It seems like Nephi is tweaking the story a bit so that we'll hear echoes and draw connections and so on. And I think he's doing this in all kinds of ways. So he wants us to see him as a Moses figure at times, or he wants us to see him as a David figure uh, or a Joseph figure. I think these are all there. But um, And so, yeah, he plays a bit with the history. Incidentally, I think um, Mormon does this too. And uh, think, think of when you read Mormon 1 through 7, and he tells the story of these final battles and how this all wraps up. You would get the impression reading those chapters, there's like one guy who believes, and it's Mormon, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone else is a lost cause. Then you get to the book of Moroni, and Moroni says, let me give you a few documents from the archive. Here's a sermon my father gave, and here are a couple of letters. And you read them, and you're like, so there are whole congregations of believers. And <laughs> right when Moroni pulls out original sources, you realize how much Mormon is kind of leaning editorially on the text on the texts in his own archive to tell a story with a point or a purpose. And this is how ancient people thought. Um, they, they didn't think in terms of strict historical accuracy the way we do. They thought what matters is the, the moral lesson and it's okay to adjust parts of a story or to uh, recast it to, to teach. Yeah, it sort of reminds me of the idea of a, of a prophet as a poet. 
or maybe mm-hmm. a composer, you know, when, when you compose a piece of music, you have themes that recur again and again in order to help people understand the meaning that you're trying, trying to put across. Exactly. Okay, the next question reads, perhaps this is better directed to Elder, should be Brother Turley. <laughs> Although the in First Nephi, what will the process look like to formally evaluate and change to the extent approved the Book of Mormon errors identified by Royal Skousen? I will say, I'm retired now from church employment, but I worked for the church for 34 years, and I'm, I'm quite aware that the work that the Royal has done on the Book of Mormon has been taken very seriously by those who are on the scriptures committee of the church, and they they evaluate uh, his his work and make it part of their own studying out of their mind as they make decisions about the, the text. That's great to know. Next question. I love to do deeper, closer readings of the Book of Mormon as you suggest. However, when I do, I find that it's sometimes much harder to have my reading be devotional. Any tips on how to marry intellectual rigor with discipleship and personal study? That's a great question. Um, let me answer it in two ways. So first, I'd suggest a divorce. <laughs> um, what I mean is, so for my own my own part, like I'm so naturally drawn toward a kind of academic, intellectual reading of scripture. So I actually split my personal study time into two parts. And one part of it, I force myself to do devotional journaling about scripture. And I do that following the Come Follow Me. I'll take whatever chunk of chapters, kind of divide it up into roughly seven parts, uh, and I'll just spend some time reading and journaling in a very explicitly devotional way, uh, asking myself whether I'm li- living up to what's being taught here or what I might draw from this uh, at a kind of direct individual level. And then I set that apart. Uh, or, that sounded awkward. I set that aside. <laughs> uh, and then uh, and then I turn to um, a kind of more more academic study. I mean, it's not the work I'm doing when I'm on campus or something, but there I start asking more questions of structure and reading for those kinds of things. So part of it for me is I actually just make a divorce and say part of my devotion is devotion, like strictly devotional, and part of my devotion is letting the academic in me run free. Um, I'll, I'll answer it the other way too, though. I think these can be wed, and for me at least, and I don't want to speak for everyone, but for me at least, this is the promise of theology. And one of the reasons that I think this series uh, is important and the emergence of a uh, theological reading of the Book of Mormon over the last couple of decades has been really promising, is that theology is a really beautiful way to bring the rigor of, of the scholarly world to the kinds of questions that drive us as believers. Uh, Theology doesn't just ask absurd questions like how many angels can you fit on the head of a pin? Theology asks questions like, what is faith? How do we understand what it means to believe? Can we take faith apart and put it back together? How does prayer really operate? Why does God care about my words? Why kneeling? And these are theological questions and they're questions that the that the scriptures uh, can answer. So for me, that's the way I do wed them is when I ask theological questions and bring the rigor of theology, but to questions that matter to me as a believer, I find I find I don't feel as split as I sometimes might. Thank you. Yeah. Next question. I know you focused on First Nephi, but how can we use the biases of the speakers of those recording the records and how they portrayed the Lamanites and how we approach our own racial and ethnic biases. Great. Um, Yeah, I wanted to write about this more in my book, um, but the racial questions in the Book of Mormon don't really come out until 2 Nephi, so I had to leave that to others. Um, But I think this is exactly the right question to ask. Um, There's a ridiculously scholarly article that is nonetheless really quite beautiful um, uh, by Jared Hickman a few years ago called The Book of Mormon is Amerindian Apocalypse, published in the journal American Literature. Uh, It's very high octane, very literary theory kind of a thing. Um, and, uh, And he's writing in a very secular context. So it's an article to be read with a bunch of caveats for uh, an average believer, I would say. Um, It nonetheless makes, I think, really amazing points. And part of what Hickman argues is that the Book of Mormon portrays racism and then critiques that racism within the book. Um, And I I think he's exactly right. Uh, We can read these people and even these prophets as fallible 
in the book. Nephi is even himself a good example. In 2 Nephi 5, he uses language that strikes us in the 21st century as profoundly racist. And there may be ways we can explain that away, and people have given lots of um, ways we could do that. Uh, but another way to understand it is to say Nephi struggled against his own, the culture that surrounded him. It's Nephi who, one, uses language that strikes us as very racist, and who says, God invites all to come to him, black and white, bond and free, male and female. So one and the same prophet here, struggling from within a culture against that culture when he can hear God's voice really clearly. That seems to me to be uh, a, a, an inspiring model within scripture for what, what we ourselves are doing. If we point our fingers at Nephi and just say, ah, oh, racist, I want to say, yeah, who's going to be pointing fingers at you? Slow way down. Watch how Nephi is struggling to get this right. And let's see if we can do the same. Thank you. Next person's written, I'd like to hear from Joe about what the word theology means. Do all the authors in the series see it the same way? What kind of theology does Joe see happening among Latter-day Saints? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a good question. Um, it definitely does not mean the same thing for all people, even within this series. Uh, and I, mean, I was one of the editors of the series, and um, and these were some of the discussions we had early on, like how wide a definition do we want to have? Uh, and we, I mean, we decided deliberately, like, no, we want a variety of approaches to this. Uh, if you read the volumes that are already available, yeah, you'll find very different approaches. For Terrell Givens, theology means what have people said theologically in history, and how does the Latter Day Saint theology or doctrine differ? Like that's what he means by theology historical reconstruction of theological commitments of non-Latter-day Saints, and then what this book might tell us. Um, for some, doing theology means let's ask who God is, let's ask who human beings are, uh, let's talk about their relationship to each other. Um, for others, theological reading means something like asking very big theological questions and kind of seeing how this book might speak to it. Um, for me, theological reading means asking what the theological commitments of the text are. What's Nephi's project uh, and how is he constructing it and how might that shape my own theological reflection? But yeah, there's not there's not one answer here. And, um, and we're kind of in the middle of, I mean, what I would call a kind of theological renaissance uh, in Latter-day Saint intellectual culture last year. Yeah, I think it was last year, Patrick Mason uh, wrote a blog post for the Maxwell Institute uh, and said on it, um, the 20th century was the century of Latter-day Saint history, uh, and the 21st century will be the century of Latter-day Saint theology. Um, I might have jumped up and down reading that, because <laughs> I think Patrick is exactly right. Um, there's a lot happening, but that means that there's a, lot, it's a kind of let 10,000 flowers bloom and let's see. <laughs> Let's see what uh, what comes of them. So lots of options on the table right now of what it means to read theologically and how we ought to read theologically. And, uh, and we'll kind of see how this plays out over the next couple of decades. I'm excited. I'm excited as well. Next person writes, I've heard of this outline of Nephi's corpus as representative of the temple drama. First mm -hmm. Nephi 1 to 18, pre-mortality. First Nephi 19, to 2 Nephi 5, the fall, 2 Nephi 5 to 30, the atonement, 2 Nephi 30 to 32, the veil. What do you think about this? Um, yeah, well, um, I don't know where, uh, I didn't see who asked the question. I don't know where uh, you came across that, but that comes from my first book. <laughs> so uh, I wrote a book a few years back called Another Testament. And um, and what I do in that, my, my reading of Nephi's whole book at that point was see a kind of creation story followed by a fall story, followed by a kind of atonement story, and then a kind of passing through the veil. Um, I'm less smitten by that reading than I once was, but I think there's still something to it. And um, so I would tweak it now in ways, uh, but, uh, but, I, but I, still like, I still like the reading and I think it can do some work for us. Um, but yeah, if you wanna see uh, how I've laid that out before, um, my book and other Testament, for, uh, chapter two of that book, I lay that out. And I think for those searching for it online, it is two words and other, is it not? Yeah, two words and other testament. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Next person asks, I know you have written before about the differences between Nephi's, Jacob's, and Lehi's understandings of Isaiah. Mm -hmm. Can you summarize your findings? Sure. Um, yeah. 
we get just a couple of glimpses. This is uh, from another book I wrote called um, The Vision of All. Uh, but yeah, so uh, we get just a couple of glimpses of Lehi uh, interacting with Isaiah. We get one in 1 Nephi 10 where he's using the language of Isaiah 40. Um, and then in 2 Nephi 2, we get him using what seems to be the language of Isaiah 14, but just a couple of little bits where he's using it. And for Lehi, um, it's, he's not reading it the way that Nephi does at all. For Nephi, uh, it's this massive project that's unfolding in Isaiah that outlines what God is doing in all of history. And Nephi wants to liken that to the branch of Israel that he's a part of. Uh, Lehi is looking through it for sort of insights, if you will, doctrinal insights. Uh, he sees Christ here and he sees Satan there and, and so on. Uh, so Nephi has a kind of program or a project that we don't seem to see in Lehi. Jacob's very similar to Nephi. Um, he seems to have been uh, under Nephi's tutelage uh, as a reader of Isaiah. But there's a really striking difference as well. When Nephi reads Isaiah, he tends to summarize what Isaiah is saying on his own terms very quickly and then move immediately to likening. Okay, so you got Isaiah really quick? Okay, good. Now let's go on and talk about what's happening with our own people in the future. Where Jacob, by contrast, tends to stay with Isaiah for a really long time. Here's what this means about Jews and what's going to mean about them in exile and them coming back and what's going to happen with the Messiah. Jacob dwells on this at length and then will say, okay, now quickly let's liken this. So it seems that uh, both Nephi and Jacob have similar methods, but they dwell on different parts of it and seem to, uh, yeah, seem to get more excited about different parts of it, which is interesting. We've got more questions based on the schedule I was handed. We need to wrap up. So I'll read this next one very, very quickly and ask you for a short answer. Okay. So our time deadline. I really like how you discussed real faith, page 71, and the connection between obedience and suspending shared ethical attitudes. I would love to hear more thoughts about what this means at this time when we see in the U.S. and many other countries an increasing polarization of thought that almost creates a divided set of facts, separate trusted sources, and essentially opposing group ethical attitudes. Will this change what radical obedience looks like? Is radical obedience in harmony or at odds with exact obedience? Boy, that is a thick, complicated question to do really quickly. Um, yeah, I'm trying to take it in. Uh, I think I might have to pass on that one. There's too much to do there too quickly. Um, but Michelle, uh, email me, Michelle. <laughs> uh, I'm really easy to find. Joseph underscore Spencer at byu.edu. Send me an email and I'll, I'll take some time and really wrestle with your question and, and send you a response. And I assume that invitation is also open to others whose questions we haven't answered. Yeah, of course, yeah. All right, thank you very much. Thanks, Rick. Well, we want to thank, thank uh, Joe and also each of you for joining this evening and for your participation and excellent questions. We remind you that a recording of tonight's session will be available on the Witso Foundation YouTube channel later this week. Our next Book of Mormon conversation will be on September 6th at 5 p.m. Pacific time between Terrell Givens, who has written the series volume on 2nd Nephi, and Laura Redford from the Witso Foundation. We invite you to join in at that time. Thank you all very much and good night. Thanks.